Mircea. I'm working for Oris Romania, which is uh, uh, the largest mobile telecom operator in uh, here. Uh, we are actually uh, now uh, have been uh, we are having a quite a, a large organization inside and uh, today I want to share with you some of the things which are going on in the development area architecture operations and uh, what we are trying to do uh, in order to be able to cope with the actual competition in the market which uh, assumes that uh, every once in a while, maybe twice a week or something like this, some new offer, it's, uh, it's uh, out of the market or uh, systems to support uh, this uh, needs to be built. Uh, what I'm trying now to say is uh, a journey uh, to, po to actually uh, tell you. It's a journey that we started uh, around how to make uh, the job of the developers easier for uh, easier from the point of view of uh, deployment and operations how we can ensure some uh, level of quality in the code and uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, something which is um, uh, how we, can we recover from uh, certain situations because failure happen uh, and uh, what is the expected minimum time in order to uh, to be able to restore the services to our the customer uh, what we started with, uh, uh, this journey started actually quite uh, long ago, uh, mostly like uh, informing and having ideas about what to do. Uh, the idea, what we observe inside the organization is that there are uh, lots of changes which are going on concurrently, uh, changes in the software systems which affect each other, and uh, these software systems have uh, actually uh, uh, dependencies between them. Uh, and at each dependency, at each handover, actually we see that there are uh, time, there are times which are uh, considered as waiting times and handover. And uh, we took a look at what's uh, going on on the actual software development uh, at the others, and uh, we find a little bit of uh, inspiration uh, in the others, uh, what they wrote, what they actually um, did when complexity rose, and uh, how they handled this. Uh, from our point of view, we took the first approach looking at the organization. The first approach would be, uh, for example, when you have something, uh, a line of code to deploy inside the organization, how long does it take to do this? And this is not enough uh, just to put it like this because actually uh, you want this to, do, uh, to be done repeatedly. You don't want to depend on uh, people during the boring stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff which uh, uh, is uh, the same and which can be, automi automi uh, can be done automatic. This idea came from the book which is called Implementing Lean Software Development, which is a book of uh, Mary and Tom Papendick. Uh, and uh, they actually put this uh, question at, uh, at the beginning of the book, uh, somehow inviting you to, to identify those wasting areas. Uh, inside your organization where waiting times are, are uh, long, where uh, actually people depend on each other. And um, another uh, actual um, incentive to start this uh, journey was also the, what I told you at the beginning, uh, the mindset that we had inside the organization about failure is not an option. Uh, if you ask the normal manager or normal people inside the company, uh, the most logical, uh, let's say, uh, when you ask them about the reliability of the system or the, or the uh, when you are building something is, you do not need to fail. You don't have to fail. You must not fail. And this is actually something that we, as software developers, cannot guarantee because failure uh, is actually happening either by human error or by uh, uh, I don't know, failure to the physical system, networking, and so on. The idea is that this already happens in the market, and uh, we actually seen this um, uh, at, at the others bigger, much bigger than us. And uh, they had, in back in 2009, this type of screens, which they uh, put uh, when they had a problem. And this type of screens went very viral, and uh, actually they were becoming like a, I don't know, uh, somehow very proud of them. I, I, I kind of identify this kind of problems when you put something like this because it's over capacity. Uh, 
the idea what we try to change is embrace the failure, embrace the fact that this will happen and actually optimize for something else. This will happen as well as uh, to us. Failure is practically inevitable. We, to we took this as a, uh, as a given. We actually went uh, to uh, how to transform this failure in a learning opportunity. Actually, how do we detect the failure quickly? Uh, and the most important thing actually is about how to restore the service to the customer quickly. And by customer here, I'm not referring only to the uh, external orange customer, which is the subscriber or the prepay, uh, actually to also our colleague inside the company, because we are using the systems that we are building inside IT, and uh, they are operated uh, by them each day in shop, dealers, chains, franchises, all, all these chains. And uh, this is something that uh, we put as a pro, uh, as a uh, as a possible uh, improvement. And also, there is another thing which happens in the telecom. I don't know uh, if uh, it's very visible here inside uh, in Romania. The idea is that telecom is no longer a network stuff. You don't actually. Uh, buy bo uh, boxes and put them in your uh, data centers and just they work uh, and uh, you hope that they work. So telecom transformed actually in IT. Everything that we do inside Orange is, 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 uh, has a big, big, big component uh, related to software. We actually have their software which does the routing, which sends SMSs, which sends, uh, enables data, does the charging, does the prepare charge, all this stuff. Uh, it's not a hardware platform here. Is that just servers communicating with other platforms and making this possible. Also, another reason for continuous delivery, because if you attended the previous talk, uh, Tim spoke about microservices, about the composition of system. What this means, actually, uh, you determine that when you have lots of platforms and you want to make changes to them, you actually see that uh, changes, uh, doing changes become harder with much impact uh, between the platforms. And what uh, does this mean? What solutions do we have as developers is either to actually continue do, uh, doing this or to split the system? And you want to split the system or if you are in the lucky position where you are building a new system, you actually build them uh, already split. And you are actually building some kind of components. Now there is a trend to call them microservices, but uh, this is uh, what we put here is actually very valid also in the previous day between microservices. They just call it different way from my point of view. It was the what uh, uh, SOA supposed to be. And uh, we actually identify that we can leverage this. And how do we do it pragmatically? How do we want to put them into production at that moment? And uh, t as Tim said uh, in the previous talk, you will add complexity to your environment. And this complexity actually uh, needs to be handled. This to uh, make it predictable and actually to be able to deploy any change quickly. And you need a system which allows, to do, allows you to do this. And this kind of system, you need to do the thing automatic again. Um, we are not ready yet. I, I mean, microservices, we are building these kind of applications um, uh, for the new systems. We are using actually quite fervent users of Spring Boot, for example, which allows us to, uh, to uh, take the approach of uh, small components which uh, can be deployed separately. But we found out that if you want to do this, and or if you want to think about how how many of this you need to uh, manage afterwards when you uh, when the explosion will happen, we you need to be prepared for this. And uh, this microservices uh, swarm uh, needs to be somehow um, somehow managed. And in your uh, in order to be uh, to do this, you need to be prepared. And what actually means you need to do uh, have the all automatic ways to do this stuff in production, uh, to deploy safely any changes, to monitor, to log, and uh, uh, to actually introduce new features in the systems which uh, uh, might product uh, might produce uh, either effect uh, to the customer or to our uh, to our internal systems. Uh, what happened inside the company, actually? We started uh, recently, recently meaning uh, almost a year and a half, I think now. Uh, the idea is how, how to get started in an organization which has in only in IT around 200 people. 200 people, uh, meaning 
uh, developers, project managers, analysts, all this stuff. Uh, also, there are colleagues in our departments because we are split. We are traditionally uh, split as a telco. We have IT and operations. And uh, uh, this was a traditional, traditional way to, to do this in a, let's say, classic telecom. What we are now trying to do is actually form these uh, uh, teams which are responsible from start to end, uh, from uh, actually implementing, running, monitoring, and fixing whatever happens uh, in case of failure. Uh, the idea is that we started with very simple, with some enthusiasts, and enthusiasm. And this enthusiasm actually means how, uh, how to convince the others that what you are trying to do is helping them because it's hard to do this in an organization which does uh, the things traditionally, uh, like uh, maybe waterfall, maybe some teams do a kind of agile, some of them are doing, uh, uh, following uh, a flow of uh, working task base, or Kanban base, or whatever, and uh, you need to actually sell this value to you, to your colleagues. And do, we started doing this with a presentation, of course. We distilled a presentation like this, and this is the presentation which was explaining the why and actually how to do it, it at a very high level because uh, we are doing uh, lots of applications, lots of systems inside the company and these uh, systems actually uh, have uh, different technologies, different components. Most of them now are custom made, are done in house, but lots of them already have components uh, which are brought from vendors and uh, we customize them heavily with uh, our, uh, our business, for our business. The main idea here was about making people understand. It's not something how to do it actually. You don't go to them and say you need to do this and this and this. You just need to raise awareness. And this type of awareness needs to be spread inside the organization in order to find that group of people which resonate with you and you which want to em em uh, on board uh, in this journey uh, together and actually go and spread this to others and. Uh, to their colleagues for day to day. Uh, ultimately, this is about understanding that it's supposed to change the way we work. Uh, the, it's supposed to change the way we work because you actually need to go in a different mindset where releases are not <coughs> something that you expect in three months or six months or something like this. You want to be, uh, be able to release as soon, as soon as possible, as often as possible, and actually to give a return back what you, uh, you produce to, to your business. Because for us, clients uh, is not the end user. They are beneficiary of our systems. Actually, there are people in the business like marketing, online uh, commercial, inside sales, and uh, inside other departments like PR or com, which uh, actually request us to do changes for them and implement things for them. And we actually go and map this with our organization to actually uh, what sees at the customer or at, the, uh, at the, our, uh, for example, colleagues in the shops or dealers or partners. So how we join the actual army here? It's about, uh, uh, we don't want to give another uh, definition of DevOps here. The idea is that actually the circles inside the, the diagram are just the departments here. <laughs> so we have the Dev, which means uh, in IT, IT. Uh, we have uh, Ops, which has, is a separate uh, department, as I told you. And uh, we have the enthusiasts, which might come from whatever department they come. And the idea is actually to merge these, uh, these teams and actually find the, that common thing which gets you started to this. And uh, what, uh, when we are trying to explain them what we are going to do, we actually, uh, I don't know, you are actually preparing for this. So the idea is that uh, we embrace the fact that the error is human and we <coughs> actually give you the chance to propagate the errors to, to all the servers that you are managing, for example. Hard to sell. Uh, so how we started the, a year ago, this was uh, 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 about seven DevOps, we call it, which is some more precise definition would be a group of people. One project, one project meaning that we chose from the old application that we had only one, uh, because we wanted, we chose a complex one in, uh, mostly, because we wanted to actually uh, uh, try to 
uh, hit the real problems. We don't want to make it here works of art. We don't want to automatize a uh, the deployment or the, uh, the quality uh, or to improve the quality for a single application. I'm looking here for a template, for a way to actually scale this after the initial project. And uh, this opportunity comes only once. Because uh, why, uh, why I say that? Because if you somehow dissipate the effort inside the company, or you don't produce results which are somehow measurables, uh, meaning that you want to, to prove that, for example, if they give you the, this chance to do something, at the end you need to, to actually show this and actually uh, uh, provide, uh, convince that they have value. They, because what happens after the POC, the proof of concept, actually you want to go to the others and make like a blueprint, uh, it's a kind of uh, plan uh, and uh, you need to give them somehow of uh, documentation which allows them to do this on the same consistent way. You want to do the, the deployment automatically in a certain way for the certain type of application. You want to monitor in a certain way. You want to detect the errors in a certain in the same way actually everywhere. Uh, we want, uh, of course, uh, our uh, inspiration was uh, what to do in order to to obtain this buy-in. We actually went to managers, actually to the director of the department, uh, operations as well, and we proposed this uh, way. We told them about uh, what we're supposed to build, what we're supposed to do. Of course, managers can be either, okay, don't, uh, spoil, uh, don't uh, spoil my business. The fortunate, uh, uh, the fortunate uh, situation in Norway for many are, uh, are that the directors and managers are very supportive from the point of view of uh, implementations and uh, uh, the uh, possibility of trying new things and <coughs> they actually are quite okay. And uh, at the end, when we presented them what we are trying to achieve, we wanted to do something like this, which is a very, very, let's say, very thin uh, uh, explanation of what the deployment pipeline is here. The deployment, uh, if you are not familiar, the deployment pipeline is uh, just an abstract thing. It's not uh, something which is a pattern or something, it's a set of practices. And uh, this set of practices, uh, actually it was distilled by a very, uh, from different uh, projects by two very famous guys now, because they actually wrote a book which looks like a bible, which is called uh, Continuous Delivery. It's about uh, Dave Farley and Jess Humble. They actually wrote the book of continuous delivery, actually. If you want to find out more, you should go there and uh, download this book or uh, buy it, and uh, you will actually, <laughs> and you will actually uh, see that what I mean there and about their completeness. The idea is how to do this all these steps automatically, and leave the decision of going to production at the at the uh, let's say mercy of the people which are entitled to say I'm okay to go live with this. And uh, as I told you, uh, our, uh, our purpose was actually to have a push to release button, somehow very scary, but uh, we hope to know, uh, not to make it this, uh, like this scary, but at orange scale. What does it mean, that, uh, does it mean at orange scale? It means that we need to take into account that almost every application that we do, we deploy in clusters. <coughs> we, deploy, uh, we don't deploy single nodes. Actually, only the, let's say, non-critical applications are deployed or the ones which are uh, living for a certain period of time. For example, we have application which we do for a certain offer, which may last, for example, three, three months. And at that moment, if we estimate that the traffic is okay and uh, if uh, the service is not critical or we, if we have other countermeasures that uh, uh, we can cope in case of failure, we say it's okay to leave it like this and we don't do anything uh, more for this. This is a, also a perfect opportunity for the developers to try new languages, new things, uh, maybe a, a certain technology that they want to, that they want to do, for example, Scala or other, I don't know. So to give you an example what I mean at all in scale, this is uh, something that we actually aim to do here uh, in about, conti uh, about continuous delivery. Uh, my account, which is uh, uh, of a e-care application for Orange Romania, is actually one of the most important for online. I don't know if it's uh, for everyone, but we are trying to move the customers towards digital and most of our interactions <laughs> will be done online. The idea is that, as I told you, uh, we are uh, usually in the position where we deploy clusters. And we are now, 
actually trying to switch from monolithic applications, meaning the ones which are a single, uh, single ER uh, jar or something like this, to more components. And uh, at that moment, we have cluster of them. And these components, actually, we deploy them uh, at several times, maybe two times a week now. Some of them, some of them once a week, some of them uh, Maybe, maybe less. And the idea is that we want to make this as easy as possible for the ones which are developing code, actually the, the developers here. So what we, we want to do, and actually we'll try to show you in the second part of the, of the, of the presentation and after the break, is uh, related to how to push changes into production in a standardized way, in a way that we, we can uh, control, in a way that we allows us to roll back in case of failure, because this can happen, or what I said at the beginning, to actually allow us to push a fix into production in case that something gone bad, which means rolling forward. So for a normal developer, now for example we have here a prod instance and a UAT instance, and a developer commits code. We have a, a continuous integration on this. Uh, we are using a product here. I will tell you about products uh, that we use because uh, since the, you may wonder what, what we are using, what we have chosen, and actually you will see in the second part uh, more what we selected after careful examination. And uh, for now, for example, we have the uh, Git which is, uh, in our case, because we, we deploy uh, code and uh, store it uh, internally, we deploy on Atlassian Git, uh, on Atal Atlassian Stash, which is a Git repository. Uh, Team City is our continuous integration server, but, but uh, they actually, uh, we will see uh, that uh, we have uh, alternatives. The developers can choose this, uh, either Jenkins or Team City. We have an automation suite, which is called Randek, and uh, you will see uh, what it, uh, how it looks like. Uh, for example, if you want to push the v1.1 into production, uh, this will go first on dev. On dev, we deploy it automatically. Randic is an orchestration engine. And it actually uh, prepares the server, puts them, into, uh, push, uh, puts them into a certain environment, which is called UAT, and at some point allows us to uh, actually deploy. Actually, it's called promoting uh, the, 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 the same binary to, to the other uh, to the other uh, area, which is actually the one which is the uh, ER5. And uh, we, do this with, uh, uh, we do this with, uh, with the possibility of moving the traffic from a device which is called a load balancer, which is here uh, at the top. Uh, this uh, uh, load balancer allows us to migrate traffic from one version to another. Uh, on the event that we want to push another version, we just put the, uh, we just put another version, we prepare again the machine from the scratch and uh, we deploy it again. So, as I told you, this is what we, we, we do. This is from what we started. Uh, what is continuous delivery? Actually, very common and popular topic. We want to be able to do small frequent changes in the production. It's actually for us a method of reducing failure because we have lots of things going on and we want to control this uh, and actually be able to fix them quickly. Uh, it's uh, actually another way we use this to give our uh, business, the, require, uh, the requesters, a way to look at the features before going to live. And you'll see in, uh, in a minute uh, what I mean. And also, it's not something that is a product, it's a set of tools. It's actually a set of practices enabled by a uh, collection of, uh, of applications, a tool set. You may wonder now what is the difference in the case of a continuous deployment between a uh, continuous delivery between a deployment and a product launch. For us, we want to be this something as switch as very simple as making a product launch, just enabling a, a feature into production without deploying, without uh, additional testing. If you are developers, uh, probably you are very familiar with this pipeline. Uh, the, the idea is that you, uh, you want to do these things automatically. You want to have a constant feedback from the, your CI server, from the version <coughs> control. You want to fail the tests in case that uh, something goes wrong. And uh, at some moment in time, you want to push the button to, to go to, to production. Uh, this is the uh, schema which I took from the book, uh, Continuous Delivery, but here you, you can see what we are using uh, for, for our uh, 
a way of controlling, uh, uh, actually implementing this pipeline. So we have here uh, Team City, an artifactory, which is a re binary repository for storing the artifacts generated by the application. We can store .NET, uh, uh, Java, even Docker containers uh, for this. Uh, we will use Selenium, JMeter for load testing. We have here a manual test uh, tool, which is called Enterprise Tester for uh, manual tools done by, by, for manual tests done by the by the QA. Um, also use uh, version control, as I told you, Atlassian Stash from Git and uh, somehow SVN from the older projects. Also keep in the in the repository also the configuration settings for prod, uh, dev, and so on which is a nice way to track and to have uh, traceability. We try to stick to this principle here. The principles are uh, uh, somehow taken from the, from the uh, let's say, the common knowledge. And uh, we want to show you now how we use currently these uh, practices inside the real application. Here you have uh, the principle of blue-green deployments. Blue-green deployment meaning that you want to switch from a version to another very swiftly without redeploying. And we have this applied a little bit different. We have, uh, for example, we want to migrate from web logic, where you have applications which run inside the web logic, to another container or application server. And we did this, uh, adapted this blue-green de uh, deployment to our to our own use. We have a machine, for example, or a set of machines which run WebLogic, and we want to deploy on JBoss. Actually, have the same binary of, uh, with the configuration, we, we just put them in without any downtime for the first instance. And when we are ready with the deploy, we actually <coughs> send the traffic to, to the, the other instance using the same database at the end. This is very uh, common way to do this. PHP is very uh, trivial to do this because you just copy files inside uh, inside the new directories, and this actually is uh, uh, a little bit harder in Java because you need to deploy stuff and you need to wait. Another way to control uh, what we do in life, we want to commit into into production actually as fast as possible. The new features, and new features meaning that even complex features, because uh, at some point in time we are going to release. I don't know very, uh, very uh, clear here. The idea is that we have all these features here, we have states for them, on-off, or partial uh, states, meaning that, for example, we enable a certain feature for orange, from Orange IPs, and our testers can test the actual feature in live without uh, impact for the other customers which uh, are actually uh, seeing the same my account, for example, it actually allows us to do all this stuff, uh, all this type of logic here. Another thing that uh, we try out now is about database migrations. We want to extend the, the evolvability of the applications, also the same incremental way of deploying changes, also to the database level. And this database level means that you need to control and synchronize the databases between development, UAT, and production. And you, you, and you need to do this first reliably, then without uh, doing some kind of manual synchronization, and you want to do this repeatably. And here you, uh, we have two tools. Uh, one is for Java, which is called Flyway, which is very good, and uh, it allows us very, uh, to actually uh, control the way we deploy changes. We need, you, the principle here is that you can migrate the version and version the database to a new version with a small incremental change, or you can revert back the change and destroy something like this. The other tool um, is for .NET, which is very uh, also used. I will show you a code's uh, example here. Is the idea that you can do code-based migration. What does it mean? A code-based migration means that you actually write SQL in, uh, inside, uh, for in this case, in C sharp and fluently. What, uh, what does this bring you? This gives you independence of database. Because actually, Fluent Migrator can uh, actually serve the translate this code to actual uh, real SQL, depending on the database where you are deploying. And uh, how does it look to deploy a, a migration? Uh, sorry, uh, here the I main idea is that you want to version all the changes, and you version this in code together with your project. 
how do you run a migration? How do you upgrade the database actually here? You have a command line, for example, in this case, but you can have a, a, a class inside your application which you execute at the run, uh, the startup of the application, or you can run manually with uh, an interface and so on. You just uh, show them, uh, you say the, the dialect, you say the, 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 the component, the jar or the DLL, which uh, does enable, uh, contains the migrations, and uh, uh, automatically the tool will run the, the method up, which allows us to create, in this case, the table. If something goes wrong, for example, you want to test this several times, you can do this on the development machine, as well you can delete, actually, the table. It's your responsibility, of course, to control these changes in the, inside the production, and uh, this needs to be used with careful. Uh, just a side note, uh, the first time when someone used for us uh, this tool, they actually cleaned up and deleted the entire database for tests, so this needs to be handled with care. Uh, the other idea that WAMT uh, is promoted by, uh, by uh, continuous uh, delivery, it's about how do you make sure that after you deploy something, it's actually up. It actually means that it's ready to be, for example, migrated to live traffic. And you need to do this as a, another step inside your deployment pipeline because you want to test this. And how do you test it? A very simple test. For example, make a, an HTTP request to your login page. Or if you want to go more in depth, you can uh, actually run a login. Um, or you, in case that you have business functionality that you want to, to validate, you actually do something like recharge a test prepare. Uh, of course, important, there are metrics which you need to, uh, to gather. The metrics are very various. Maybe you are aware already of the things. We try to make them as simple as possible to collect. And we actually wanted to make this um, uh, more standard. Then we establish a naming rule for this, which we propagate to all the system in order to be able to do something else, to plot them and actually uh, later at that point. At that point. And actually, we selected some tools, open source tools, which allows us to plot these metrics inside these nice graphics. And these nice graphics actually show you what's happening in real time inside the project. Or uh, how do you do metrics? Uh, how do you insert metrics inside the cause? Uh, very simple. This is the simplest way, which uh, you just do something like increment something, which recharges and so on. You can have timers. You can go crazy with uh, annotations. You can do all these stuff attributes. Uh, for Java, uh, this, whole, uh, this library from uh, Codahel seems the most, uh, uh, most mature in this, uh, and uh, we are using it in production with uh, very much success. There is another uh, operational aspect here, because you are, uh, as I told you, you want to deploy on a new machine on every deploy. And uh, at that moment, the logs are not kept forever, because the mach machines that where are you are deploying will eventually be, be deleted. And in that moment, you actually need to collect them in a centralized location. So you need to do some kind of log shipping. And log, uh, we look at the market, the uh, open source market, actually, because uh, we don't want to, we want scale, we don't want to burn money. Uh, we, we found out that you can do this with Logstash, for example. And Logstash allows you to index the logs, later plot or display some uh, statistics as some of them, and most importantly, to, to search for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, patterns. They actually can, uh, for example, uh, collect and uh, aggregate logs from different machines, and you can search using this nice interface for the same strings uh, on all the machines at once. At once. Uh, this is the first part of our presentation. It's, uh, it was about more software practices. Uh, on the second part, my colleague Virgil will tell you about the infrastructure automation. And uh, at the moment, uh, I invite you to ask any question that you might have. Uh, I know that is late. You can ask me in the break or afterwards. I'll be here. Please. Uh, a short question because your story is very interesting, actually. Um, the question would be, you said you mentioned at one point that uh, one and a half years ago you started with this project as a pilot, yeah, in yeah. a company with, uh, with just one app. <coughs> Where are you now? Where I am now, we are now trying to prepare this infrastructure, and we have a, uh, an infrastructure which runs on a staging environment. Now, uh, Virgil will show you what tools we use there, and I should try to do some kind of demo. What follows next is actually 
extend the application, we, we optimize the application, we establish a, set, uh, a common set of goals, we identify the technology that we already presented you, and uh, we are ready to extend to production, and we are act actually building the whole infrastructure for the production use now. But you are still in this pilot, so you didn't extend to all the applications. No, no, not pilot. yet, not still yet, in the pilot, not yet. But have done at least one production uh, rollout with this uh, approach. A stage, a, a stage. stage, not production. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Do you have zero downtime deployments using the blue green? Zero downtime deployments actually, if they can be done like this, actually we are using the load balancer in front of the in front of the applications to do this. We actually keep the traffic on the uh, previous version, and when we are ready, we are sw we can switch this to to the next version. And uh, this requires a certain, uh, let's say, a certain discipline from the point of view of application makers because you need to do as stateless as possible the applications and this requires deep changes in some areas and we started to do this and embrace stateless services and uh, <coughs> stuff or to keep the, the shared state inside outside the processes for example memcache redis and other uh, and other caches which allows you to actually tear down the application and then raise another node which will take the, the shared data that you need to have uh, Java is, uh, I have a personal uh, opinion here, is about uh, the way they manage sessions inside the app, app container. It's uh, somehow, if you are not prepared for this, actually they, they require a lot of synchronization between nodes and so on. And most of the synchronization is done async because of performance reasons. And in case of, for example, when you want to deploy a new version and you put it into production the, for the next, you actually be, need to be sure that the old session uh, and the old machine is actually cleared out of anything and the users and the session has already migrated to the other nodes in order to be able to keep the service up. How do you do rollbacks? Rollbacks actually, as I told you, it's just moving the traffic because we can keep the okay. two nodes up, mm -hmm. uh, for example, or uh, in case that uh, we will manage to do this into, inside the uh, automatic way, we actually want to do roll forward, not roll back. Yeah. So, if you have two applications possibly running, two versions of the same application, what about database updates? My, no, my database is not uh, something that we target to do continuously, for example. Um, we look a, a little bit in the market, uh, I saw that maybe now nobody does these kind of changes. We are not in the position of, uh, for example, other big uh, software companies where we have uh, monster machines or lots of machines, uh, databases sharded and so on. We actually have pretty powerful servers, physical servers for our databases and we are not in the position where we need to handle the, uh, I don't know, sharding and something like this for database stuff. But the idea is that uh, when you want to do role, uh, to roll changes into the database, you actually do them either manually, like I showed you, or in the inside the continuous integration, like a certain step, and you roll the this in a way it's compatible. For example, you don't uh, destroy fields; you just create new ones. You enlarge existing fields, but with careful consideration for the fact that certain databases, these operations might lock for example, the tables or do some kind of uh, uh, internal synchronization which might affect the performance in production. So you're not, so you're or not the other way is to run them in the maintenance window because we, we um, also have this kind of stuff and uh, it's not a problem. To so you stay, you stay away from uh, breaking changes at database level because it would break the older version? The idea is that you need to be careful. Yeah. It's not about breaking changes. If you are ready and you have a maintenance window, it's fine to oh. do it uh, like this. Yeah. We use also scripts. We are not in the very, very, uh, uh, let's say, very uh, perfect position here. We actually use a combination. We extend this to developers. It's no problem. How do you manage config configuration across environments? So runtime configuration in plain configuration. Uh, what we do see here is uh, something for the new application, I'm telling you. The old ones we migrate to carefully because it's kind of slow because we have uh, lots of configuration either kept inside the properties file and so on. We actually establish, I told you that we are using, for example, Spring Boot. Spring Boot is a collection of, uh, let's say, a blueprint for creating small services in a standard way. And uh, this Spring Boot allows you to actually, from the beginning, we try to put there inside the the 
blueprint best practices for this. And the one way to, to deploy differently, or the same binary, because this is the whole idea of continuous delivery, of continuous deployment, is uh, to actually externalize the configuration. And we try to, to put everything which is uh, not common in, in separate property files. The property files are, instead of being selected by Maven, for example, at the build time, we want to delay this decision of selecting based on the environment where they are deployed. And we took the proper file on the configuration, on the, on the environment where we deploy this. And we extract this file from a configuration from Git, from Git repository. And okay, so on deploy time, you actually retrieve the file from Git? And yes, yes. Uh, well, Virgil will, uh, will explain you a little bit. We do this uh, with Puppet, I think, now. And, uh, How is the Selenium testing going for you? Selenium testing, uh, it's about we, uh, we choose what to test, actually. We don't do extensive testing automatically. We actually ramp it up here because there is a knowledge that we will need to acquire. And we have uh, internal people which uh, actually want to do this. And they actually do this for all parts of existing apps. Or if they say, uh, if they feel that it's something that brings value because they need to do, for example, repetitive testing. And we, uh, we put them either uh, run manually at some point on the UAT or on the production, this is also possible, or we put them inside the, where it's possible in, uh, inside the continuous integration stuff. Uh, the main idea here is about uh, how do you do, for example, changes to something repeatedly. Because, for example, if you want to activate roaming, in our case, you cannot do this again and again and again with a user every, I don't know, every deploy or every, every 15 minutes. And you need to pick carefully what, what, uh, what. How do you handle test data? For example, on the test environment, you tear it's, them? Uh, complete, no, we actually have uh, different ways depending on what uh, we want to actually test. Mm -hmm. Test data meaning like normal test data. You can use this stuff here. Uh, this stuff here to also insert test data because we, you can automatize this. Uh, the idea is now we have test data that we enter and also we uh, periodically synchronize from pro the production on a staging environment and we run this uh, on... But this, this isn't done automatically, right? This no, no, no. So you don't actually uh, tear down the database and uh, bring it up no. every time on deployment test? No, no. This is, I think, if I were to choose what battles to pick, I would go to, this would be the last one, <laughs> actually, to, to do. Okay, thank you very much.